Hey, what's up, guys? On this episode of Muscle Minds, Dr. Scott has prepared a talk for us. Topics are going to be high volume versus low volume training and high carb versus low carb dieting. Scott's brought some studies, he's got some charts and graphs. He'll be breaking everything down and helping us to understand it. And in the end, hopefully, you'll better understand what works better for you. It's all happening right here on Muscle Minds. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. This program is brought to you by truenutrition.com. They're a high quality supplement company that has been around since I've been into bodybuilding. And uh, you can use our code ADVICES for some additional savings on products like this. Scott, I'm doing, a, uh, I'm doing a test. I was using the MPA Muscle Intrusion. I have some of their, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, um, Perry MD, the, the Mountain Dog. Uh, intro workout product, but now I just bought some straight, highly branched cyclic dextrin, and uh-huh. I got the uh, lemon cake flavor. Mix this Ooh, with this is good. Yes, it it's, sounds like it, delicious. Yeah. Mix that with the EAA. I was hesitant because I know that the highly branched cyclic dextrin can be kind of rough sometimes with the wrong flavoring, mm. but it's it's the bomb, dude. Like it is yeah. so good. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. I want to do a price breakdown. I want to see, because I add in also three grams of citrulline malate to that. I want to do a price breakdown and see what I'm mm-hmm. paying per scoop compared to buying, say, a competitor's product. But I have a feeling I'm getting a you know a decent deal on it. I know that it's oh, yeah. all high quality stuff too. So uh, yeah. I, I like that. You know. Anyway, though, man. Um, 50%, you probably, there's got to be a, a 50% markup. I mean, you've got, there's just so many ways that your nutrition is cheaper. There's, they're not, they don't have labels. You're not paying for the labeling. You're not paying for all the mixing. You're not paying for the marketing. You're just True. you're getting it pretty much raw from source. So I bet you're saving a substantial amount. Yeah, yeah. I'd imagine I'm going to figure it out, and uh, and I'll let you guys know. Um, today uh, we have uh, we have a plan. Dr. Scott's got uh, lined up for us. I'm really excited about this. I've got a few figures floating around here uh, on my computer. That he'll have me pull up as we go. Uh, topic that we are looking at is. Um, is is what's better for you right based off of your based off of your biology being uh, a high or low frequency training plan as well as a high or lower carb diet is that if could, am i saying that correctly in a real yeah. sense I mean, those are just two biggies like i come across this stuff all the time but these are these are some some pretty cool data okay those are the biggest questions like oh, so how should i train <clears throat> High volume or high frequency or wh- where should it go? Like that's a big global question and people want a black and white answer, which there obviously is not, as is the case almost every single time, yeah. except for things like, you know, should I eat arsenic before I train or that kind <laughs> of thing? Probably not. And then the low carb approach. And this has been a big one because there's so much data out there. So many studies that have been done and mostly with obese women or diabetics and the bottom line, of course, is first and foremost, and this is, um, I, have a, I have a nutritional hierarchy of importance, a little pyramid that's in my book showing that caloric intake is numero uno for fat loss or trying to gain one or the other. But then the next question is, so I have to go low carb or go high carb. And pretty much the studies show, if you just kind of look at the whole of the research literature, that it's, it, it's kind of a wash. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you get like a little bit of a better increase in HDL with low carb and a little bit better of a reduction in LDL with higher carb, hypocaloric diets. So you got to have a caloric deficit. But um, sometimes you'll see – there's sometimes a little bit of an advantage for lower carb. But when all things are equal and people are adhering equally and you've sort of – you got people sort of uh, um, lodged into their their treatment – arm being that they're having to eat the diet that you've assigned to them you basically see the same thing it comes down to caloric deficit Hmm. Um, of course in the real life that's you know can be very very different you tell someone you know don't eat carbs and they're like okay that's easy i just i just avoid carbs right right. and uh, it's very i can just kind of count fat and protein it's good and it helps with appetite etc 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 but what's what is interesting about these data that we'll show, we'll talk about the training thing first, is that there's maybe something somewhat predictive about whether one person would be better off choosing one type of diet or another. Mm, okay. So I'll sit, warm people up to that. We'll go back to the training thing. So can you throw those figures up? The first one has like, let's see, it says Barcelos. 
2018 on the top, I think. Let me see here. Um, let me see what order they're in here. I can, I can figure this out. Arcelos, 2018. Um, it's got um, it's little circular dots, three groupings. Little circular dots, three groupings. Okay, yep, yeah, I think I see that one. Um, is this the one that says, oh, yeah, it says Barcelos at the bottom. Okay, I think I got that one here. Uh, give me just a second. Yep, here it is. Got it. So that's on the screen so, right now. Yeah, so the <laughs> so what this shows was an initial study. So it's just published 2018. So they were doing this, you know, just a few years ago. And they used a really, really cool design. So people talk about using like twin studies. Okay. Um, you know, this is the, the, the penultimate question. So let's imagine we got two twins and one trend, you know, just pushes the calories and the weight as hard as he can. He gets just big and fat and just becomes the biggest, strongest beast possible right. for three years. And then he spends a year dieting down, holding on all that muscle. It's a four-year plan. And his identical twin with the same genetics – you know, goes inches his way up and tries to stay lean and wants to look good for the summer and maybe competes here and there, or does photo shoots. Who's going to end up at the end of four years having made the most progress in terms of absolute muscle gain? Yeah. Like that's like, who knows, you know, and probably some variability there depends on which pair of twins you, you chose. Yeah. I would imagine. And how those particular things are kind of how they, how, how conservative the, the one twin is with keeping his body fat low and what have you. Well, this is basically the same experimental design but it's even better because twins can be subject to like epigenetic changes and there can be some genetic differences um, that, that kind of creep in over the course of a lifetime but in this case you've got even more uh, control over the genetics because they had people the same individuals train one leg one way high frequency five times a week and the other leg was trained two or three times a week hmm. So literally, it's like the, the legs are the twins. <laughs> so it's the same person. So you can compare how well does the leg train five times a week. I think they did three sets of like eight to 12, just knee extensions okay. versus two or three times a week. The same volume per workout. So the one thing I don't like about this study, but it's kind of cool to have in there as well, is that there was a difference in volume. So they didn't try to equate the volume um, that the two legs underwent, for hmm. instance, by – taking the five times a week volume and lumping that into two training sessions. They just kept the training session as a singular unit and compared five of those training sessions versus two or three. Mm. And that's what that picture shows. Let me pull it up here on my end so I can point at whatever you guys might be seeing. So yeah, on the bottom says no difference in muscle growth. Okay. Um, and one of the things that they, they said, I have a quote there at the top, so thus there may be a quote ceiling effect for total training volume on the dose response relationship of the weekly sets, at least for untrained individuals. So basically this is something you see. It's one of the main limitations that will happen hmm. in uh, subjects in, sorry, in studies where they use untrained subjects hmm. is there, they grow so easily. Yeah. So it's good. You get a nice positive training effect, but um, they were kind of growing maximally from just the two times a week gotcha. training. Um, and so adding more volume didn't do much for them. Okay. So that you didn't really get, and this is something I've talked about in other posts, uh, sort of a, a full picture of what might be happening in terms of hormesis, meaning that imagine if they train those five times a week train, the folks trained double the volume, they probably would have made lesser gains. It would have been too much. Mm. They would have been moving towards an overtraining phenomenon. Eventually, if they tried to do like, you know, three sessions a day, five times a week, that probably would have, would have whacked them pretty bad. So you don't really see that, but. So the thing that's interesting, so, that, so you look at that study, it's like, okay, so frequency doesn't matter. That's basically what you, what you come up with. And that study doesn't point to five times being better than two or three times hmm. or two being better than three or anything like that. So they're kind of looking to kind of extend what um, has come about from some uh, – two of the meta-analyses that was done by Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger and those guys, showing that you know two is better than one and – Higher frequency might allow us to do a little more, add a little more volume in, but beyond like the two to three times per week, we really don't know. There's not enough data out there. So they did two and three and five. So trying to add some data points to that higher frequency realm of the research. 
So here's the cool shit. So this is what I really like about what they did is they're like, okay, so let's take a closer look at our data. And the next one then is the, um, it's the pick that's more vertical. Uh, it's a change in CSA percentage on the left. Domus et al. 2019 follow-up okay. analysis. Uh, got it. All right. Give me just a second. I think I got this one right here. Boom. All right. We're up. Yeah. So this is what's really cool. So they, they basically just – they lump together the two and three times a week just for the sake of simplicity. Sorry, I cut off a little of my text there. But those are the individual data points um, with high frequency on the left. And then the line connecting the data point for the same individual in the other leg, which was trained either two or three times, depending on the person. Hmm. So first, first thing is look, look on the, like the very bottom left. You see an inverted open triangle there. Okay. And it's like right at that zero, that dotted zero line. Yeah. Um, and so that person, high frequency, they basically got zero change in cross-sectional area mm. at high frequency. If you follow that line off to the right, you see the lower frequencies and basically it was zilch as well. That person was not doing well. They basically <laughs> not were a non-responder in both legs, Okay, both cases. Now, look up top, like look on the far upper right, and you'll see some one, one person there with it looks like it's a kind of an open – partially open square mm -hmm. and under on the lower frequencies column that person gained over 25 percent increase in quad cross-sectional area that would have been highly visible huh wow i don't know how big they were to start but that's just tremendous i've seen um in individuals like 20 percent who are pretty muscular and it's like holy fucking shit yeah that's a lot of muscle growth you're like wow like total like that's moving up like two weight classes in the course of a year that's crazy muscle growth. yeah so that person and if you follow that follow that square follow the line down to the higher frequency it wasn't as good they're more like about 20 percent, but still that person kicked butt yeah both legs grew well, so that person would have been what you might call an extreme responder. Okay. And then, so so look, so now just look at the the, the dots on the left and the high frequency, and then on the right the lower frequency, and you'll notice the directionality of the lines. Some of them go from low to high, right? High frequency being lesser growth and lower frequency being greater growth, and some of them slant down the other direction. That's because some people grew better with high frequency training than they did with low frequency training. Huh. And some people grew better with low frequency training than they did with high frequency training. Okay. So I, this doesn't answer yeah. anything. It just raises more questions. <laughs> it, it, no, it, no, it answers it's, exactly what people it, have, what bodybuilders have known for forever. It, it doesn't tell us how to pick this thing. It doesn't tell us how to know what to do, except you have to get in there and try it. Ah, uh, okay. So, okay. I mean, I, I would love to see someone, it would be very interesting to see someone after, actually replicate them, this on themselves. You could, huh. you know, this you literally reminds me, train man. this way. Yeah. It reminds me, I, I had a knee surgery and when I did, uh, they told me I, I had to build the strength up in my legs first. I had to do physical therapy before they could do the ACL reconstruction. Prehab, yeah. Prehab, yeah. So uh, they they put me on a on a machine. It was a leg extension, and it, it looked like the Bionic Man. It was hooked up to charts and graphs and stuff. And and yeah. when I pressed, it put a, a you know a, a, a um an isometric tension against me, and it was hard to push up. And it would begin to eventually start moving, and you could see the charts moving. And he said, "Okay, now I want you to do three months of physical therapy," which I did. They had me train yeah. three times a week. Uh -huh. I, and I went to U of M, University of Michigan, did this for three three months. And I'll tell you what, Scott, because my legs, I think, have always been pretty good genetically grow, genetic growers. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> I, quads, quads not so bad yeah, either. Yeah, I went, yeah, right. I went I'm, back yeah. in and I had been, I didn't lift at the time very much. So I had a pair of shorts on, the same pair of shorts that I always wear for physical therapy. And when I came back to test again, my legs were stretching the shorts out. And uh -huh. I was so excited to sit down and test. And then the doctor looked at my legs and he was like, we don't even need to do the test. <laughs> and I was like, uh, what? But I, 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 you know, I was like planning to do the test. I never, right, right, never right, got right. to do the test again. But I feel like I would have been that guy who, but I don't know whether it was the, the amount of frequency or the fact that I just hadn't trained a lot before that, you know?
you, you would have your dots would have been at the upper upper end probably on this plot for for regardless of it was high or low frequency. So if you've been a subject. So you're saying you know my question then is you know I, I say it, it raises more questions because it doesn't tell me what to figure out, but the key is just to get in there and and see for yourself is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Like stop. So many. So often people will ask questions like. Um, is this too many sets per week? You know, I'm a, I got, I think I, I, one came across, I can't remember where it was, it was somewhere on social media, but it was like, I am a, it may have been in the advices radio forum. Actually, I'm a natural competitor. No, it was, um, sustainable self-development, uh, forum, able, mm. uh, Kasaba, I think, I'm sure I'm saying his last name, right. But it was, so he, so follow up to a post, I, a, a podcast that I'd done with him, I think. Maybe it was another one. And he said, I'm a natural, I'm a 41 year old lifetime natural competitor is nine sets per week too much. Something like that. It was very generic. And I'm like, well, first of all, hopefully you learned something over the course of you know, your lifetime training as a natural that you would know that's the case. But I can't possibly know that. Yeah. And, and the data here are showing that you can't possibly know for an individual, a black and white number of frequency per week or number of sets hmm. until they've gone in there and actually done it. Hmm. And there's so many factors, you know, that, that are involved there with, um, how much volume, how much frequency would be right for the person. Hmm. But that's, what's really cool is that. So if you look at this first study, people would say, well, you know, the scientists don't know, you know, I, I know like someone much, I know higher frequency works for me. I just know it does. And I don't care what the science says. Um, and that's what some studies might point out. There's no difference when it comes to frequency. But these scientists are doing really good work, and they went and dug into their data. If you dig enough into the data, you will realize that the data are from people who are living in the same time, space, four-dimensional reality that you and I are mm -hmm. when we go into the gym and train at Gold's or you know some underground gym someplace. Yeah. And those data will, if you look deep enough into them, reflect the same things that are going on for you and me and everyone else. Mm. Just have to look deep enough, and that's what they did. So they ran their first their their first study, and they're like, "Well, you know, it doesn't make a difference. There was a ceiling effect. It's a very good way to explain what was going on." But then they looked again. And they said, "Ah, mm. some people grow better from high volume or higher frequency. Some people grow better from lower frequency. Some people just grow better than others." Now, were so there the was there any kind of predictors? Like, did they come up with any of that? Did, could, could they tell no. us? No. Okay. That, that's where we want to go. That's yeah. what I want to be able to do. You know, I mean, it's sort of like part of me wants to know it just out of pure curiosity. Say, it could be really cool. Like, so I, I go in and you get your your genetic test. That's what the genetic ah. tests are, are proffering. Um, but I have not seen any data. This would be the perfect study to do that. They could literally do sort of, sort of a gene array analysis and just basically – which has been done. Uh, Stu Phillips has been involved with some of those sorts of things, do a, a proteomics or genomics type of study where they just look at everything and say, okay, what genes or what um, proteins that are expressed are predictive of someone who grows better from high hmm. versus low frequency. So you could literally go in and get a get your genetics tested, get your genome um, sequenced, and figure out if they'd done those those if they had biopsies, for instance, here, they could actually do something like that with subject's permission and get an idea of like, okay, the people that grow best are the people who, for instance, and we've talked, there are things we know there's, um, oh gosh, there's things called myomeres, which are uh, RNA sequences that, that block expression of proteins from mRNAs. There's the satellite cell, uh, density, Hmm. There's the um, IGF-1 release and the release of mechanical growth factor that stimulates better growth in individuals who are extreme responders, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of kind of predictors, but no genetics, like nothing. It's all sort of after the fact, like this is what explains who grew the best, but we can't say, ah, except I guess you could look at satellite cells. Hmm. You could do a singular bout and do those sorts of things. Um, but you still have to do a biopsy. It's not as easy as just like, you know, taking a saliva swab to get the DNA and saying, this is the genetic profile of someone who's going to grow really well. Hmm. Um, so that's cool to know. It would be awesome to know. I mean, you can look down the road and say, well, you know, maybe we can even sort of, um, uh, you know, engineer this into hmm. people. Hmm. Um, 
that takes me off. There's a whole other top that I want to go off to on that. That was a book that I've been listening to. Um, Nick Bostrom's super intelligence. Okay. Great. Listen from what I've seen and or sorry, heard from, for anyone who wants to get into it, he's talking about the idea of artificial intelligence and it's the, po- the threats it poses to the world. Hmm. He goes off on a little bit of a tangent at one point in time. He talks about some of the things that could be done with iterative selection of fertilized um, eggs, fertilized uh, um, gametes, where you basically sort of – and there's movies that have done this. I can't remember the name of them, but you basically would have – you would select for the genet- genes in a fertilized egg that are best predictive of high intelligence – Hmm. or large muscle mass or responsiveness to exercise stimuli or what have you. And you can do, you could do that with the right technology yeah. such that he says like literally in a matter of just continually selecting basically what they do when they, you breed animals you know, yeah. you pick the that are best or breed dogs or what have you, yeah. you select, you could do that with fertilized ova um, and stem cells and let them continue and just keep on selecting the ones that have the best DNA profile given what you know. Huh. And a matter of a couple of years, he was saying you could create individuals who by the time when they're adults would, would you would expect to have intelligence that supersedes the intelligence of any human who's ever walked the face of the planet. Holy shit. You can't tell me they're not yeah. trying that right now. Somewhere. Oh, so, someone, someone you is. Know yeah, I mean? some, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. As far so, as sports, we could just go old school and just like get Iris Kyle and Ronnie Coleman to hook up. Right. That's that's the old school way, you know. I mean, that, I mean that's literally what what you do. You you'd pick from the the best specimens, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, obviously, just ridiculous genetics. To, you know, Linda. Maybe take Linda and and Ronnie yeah. and you know and, and whoever else. Maybe toss Flex in there, and then and then you <laughs> you you combine those in various ways and start selecting. And then allowing those cells to uh, undergo mitosis and, yeah. and then keep on doing that. Huh. So you, you, that could be done. But it was just the time frame that he put forth. I can't confirm or deny that it was accurate enough, but it's, it sounded like he knew what he was talking about. And I, I suspect he did. I don't have the actual physical book. There's probably some references in there that don't come across when you listen. But anyway, so that's kind of cool stuff. And it'd be cool to know. But the but bottom line for people listening now is that is that you can figure this shit out on your own. <laughs> hmm. Like, I mean, most people who are grow really well, like most people who are IFBB pros, um, they distance themselves from their peers really, really quickly. They know, um, you know, they, they go in with their buddies and they start training and they're all like, they all start off benching and when they all get 135, that's awesome. And then, you know, the guy ends up being a good competitor, wins a state show, et cetera. He's benching two and a quarter right. t- two months later. And then 275, and then he gets on the sauce, and he's doing 365, and his buddies are still trying to do 205. Right, right. Oh, they're not even a two, two and a quarter yet. I always so, think of the Dave Henry story. The hey, You know, Scott, we, yeah. we train the same. We, yeah. we eat the same foods. I don't get it. Why, why don't you look like I do? <laughs> I know exactly. I'll never forget that one. I yeah. I can just imagine the look on your face, guy. So, guys, if you hadn't heard, Dave Henry and Scott obviously have known each other for years and years, and Scott's coached him. and And Dave turns to him one day while they're training, and he says that they're looking in the mirror at each other, you know, posing, and it's like, huh, Scott. I'm sure you were just thinking to yourself, man. I, it's, Dave, I've been thinking that every day of my life that we train together. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were both free contests, and it was that after a training session and after we got, we we're just exhausted, you know? Yeah, yeah. So he said it, and he was just like, just this free form ad lib, you know, that just kind of came out of his mouth. And it didn't even like hit me. It wasn't in any way a, a, a slight. No, no, no. Me. And I, so I didn't take it as that. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, Dave. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to at least win my weight class in my state show, and you're the reigning Mr. Olympia in the 202. <laughs> right, so right. There's a little we we had of a difference between the two of us. Yeah, yeah. But the but the same thing comes to to, to frequency here okay. for uh, individuals who are listening to this who are not sure whether or not they should try a higher frequency or lower frequency approach. They 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 may be someone. I mean, if you look at the plot here. Um, there are some people for whom the line is pretty much straight across. So the change in, quad, in cross-sectional area here is, is equal for the high and the low frequency mm. legs. And then some people, there's a pretty, pretty substantial um, slant in that line. Yeah. 
Yeah, like well, there's one person here here is like this, about the second greatest change in cross sectional area for the high frequency. It's up there, you know, about 22 or so. And if you look at the lower frequency, they're they're they got like a seven percent increase in quad cross sectional area. Yeah. yeah, tremendous. So that person is 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 definitely getting a sub at least you know as an untrained person <laughs> in the first few months of training, getting a suboptimal dose. Mm from that frequency and or that volume so what's, when they train two or three times a week. What, what's yeah. the key here then? So I, I, I know that you're telling me that what you have to do is get in the gym and, and just try it. I feel like the thing that holds us, there's a lot of things that hold us back. I know that for myself, one of them is, that it, you know, it, as in, in bodybuilding, we gravitate toward our routine and to what we're mm -hmm. comfortable with. I've talked mm -hmm. with you for literally years now on this podcast yeah. and it took me a long time to change my training split to a, a higher frequency training split. And I can say that in the last five years, that is the best change that I have made that making that decision. That's the biggest change in my training in the last five years that, I, that I've made, but to get there to like, to take it from like, okay, yeah, Scott makes a good point. Maybe that could work from getting there to actually applying it. And then actually seeing the results. I mean, that was a, there's a lot of there's a lot of time that went in between. Um, what can you suggest to people here today to 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 adapt to this? Like, like it, I mean, let's let's bring this to like the real world because there's a lot yeah. of people out there that are saying like, man, this makes awesome sense. And then guess what? They're gonna turn this podcast off. They're gonna go to the gym. And they're going to keep doing what they've always done. <laughs> right. You know, this, this comes down to literally it's a function of adherence. And most of the time you hear adherence, people are not just people that are even just exercising or not exercising. But when it comes to people who, who are training and they have a way that they like to train and they, they have it's there's some um, reward that comes immediately from the way they train. It's hard to break that. Yeah. So, yeah. Literally, I mean, the bottom line is going to going to, and I heard, um, uh, um, I'm going to miss, I know I'm going to slaughter his name, but Borga Fairley, um, B O R G E. Okay. Bla used to go by Blade many years ago on the boards a long time ago, but Borga, B O R G E. Um, and he, he has his, his, his stance. He's the one to come up with myo reps. Have you heard of myo reps? No, I haven't. No. Okay. So people who, who follow, he's like, it's a cluster set technique. Okay. So I mentioned it now and again in that context. Great guy, very very smart guy, um, and he's really kind of come in this interview. He was really focusing on it. Just kind of comes down to what you really like to do. You want to do something that kind of optimizes everything, but if it's just pure torture, mm. you know, for some way, if, if you just hate to have to go into the gym and like be anxious all day long about doing a big heavy squat that day or what have you, even though that might give you an extra you know, five or eight pounds of muscle at the end of the road at some point, mm -hmm. um, then you're not going to do it. It's not going to work for you. So you have to kind of do that, mm. um, figure out that whether what you're willing to do. And, and then I think the, the trick, the key, and this is why I'm so happy that, that fortitude training has kind of worked out the way it has. And I built this into the program intentionally kind of knowing this is that people think it's, it's fun. Mm. They enjoy the training. They're like having fun with the training. And that's the variety of it. Ah. So um, in this case, like if someone, let's say, we'll, we can take different examples and break this down and make it more specific rather than just sort of talk globally. If someone's been training like with kind of a bro split, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, once a week, what have you. Blitzy, no, she's getting ready to go. <laughs> um, then they would, if they go to a higher frequency, let's say they start training everything twice a week. Okay. And they and they or they just go to a, a push pull legs or something along those lines, then adding some variety and can make that more fun. Um, literally, adding a different set types like I have in fortitude training. So we're going to do muscle rounds, or we're going to do rest pause sets, or we're going to do high reps on one day and low reps on the other day. Whatever the person likes to do, so that it's entertaining and fun, and there's a little bit of spice in the training. So that it's not like, oh shit, like you definitely wouldn't want to um, uh, make it all, each training session sort of identical. 
maybe once a week. Like let's say you you don't like training legs, but you know I'm gonna I gotta get legs done, and I can I do okay training once a week. So I go and do my my squats, I do my leg press, I do my knee extension, hamstring curls, stiff legged deadlifts, blah blah. blah. Like I can just get through that, and then I have like six days. I don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. That's kind of tolerable for someone. Mm-hmm. But if you'd have to go in and like do the the same leg routine twice mm-hmm. a week, yeah. It's like, oh my god! Like it's like eating the same breakfast that you really are kind of like, yeah, I don't like that so much. But I'll I can put up with it once a week all the time. I got gotcha. you. So in shifting to a higher frequency approach, to some, the variety I think is is actually absolutely paramount. Um, so I like to have progressive overload. So somewhat, and, and obviously that's what you've been, you've been doing now, um, and posting about on Instagram, which is really cool with like the inclined dumbbell presses. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been fun too, man. It's a, it's a fun yeah. challenge. I'm going to tell you, Scott, this last time that I went in, I was a little scared because I, I, you know, I, I got from the, I started it with like the nineties, 95s, and I worked my way up and then I got up to the one tens and then I felt like, okay, this is really heavy. And I know that I could spend time with these now. And now I'm not going to increase the weight, but I'm going to increase increase the quality of the reps and then increase the reps from there. So I still feel yes. like that's progressive, you know? Absolutely. And so that's my new goal now is to stay with the 110s. But even that, man, I got the 110s when I was out in Vancouver. And then I, I had to train chest again when I came home. And I in that next workout, it was one of those days too where like the weights felt heavy. Like I picked up the 55s. And I'm like, ugh. ugh <laughs> it feels like this. a 65. Exactly, exactly. Or a yeah. 70. And I'm like, man, right. I don't. And there's part of me in my head is going like, I don't know if you can do this, Scott. I don't know if you can do this today. But I'm thinking like I got to do But I got it up and I managed to get one more rep out. And I feel that my form was a little bit better than it, it had been before. But I'm going to tell you, man, that was it was kind of a scary set. And it's the first time I'd really been scared in a while. Like, like yeah. I really questioned, like, am I going to be able to get this today? And I, right. I, I liked that too. I'm not going to lie, yeah. man. I like yeah. that challenge, you know? Yeah. So, so, and one thing you can do in that regard, and then I, I built this into the, my program too. It's easy just to refer back to that is that I have different volume tiers that one would auto regulate on a particular day. So let's say, you know, you're, you typically, you do two heavy compound chest exercises and two isolation for the volume tier you typically do. You're like, fuck, I don't know if I can, I can do one, but I that second one, I've just, it's not feeling that shit today. So you can still get a high quality training stimulus from dropping down a volume to and doing less. So you just do the one all out set mm-hmm. and make it, make that it. And that is a, it's, that's bite size. It's tolerable. Gotcha. So, like if you had came in, come in the next time you train chest, feeling that way that you did that day where you're a little bit scared and just, it was always like that. Eventually you, that would peter out. You, yeah. That's not sustainable. Yeah. That's what uh, I was thinking but, too. Yeah, but if you have the options, like okay, today's a little bit off, you know, maybe it, maybe it was just a deload would be an option. But I'm going to drop down and instead. Um, you're just doing the one set, but let's say you had two sets, you could just drop down to one set, or you could change things, yeah. or maybe it's just every other day. Um, you know, you might say, you know, have an option. Like today's going to be a day when I increase the reps and I choose different types of exercises. Yeah, yeah, that makes w- whatever the sort of system is. Yeah, so to, to keep it to keep it fun and and to not not be perpetually scared, I guess. And, and I guess, you know what it is for me, Scott, is that I found that I I see the, I see that this could be like, to me, I guess the most important thing is, is that I make progress. And so Mm -hmm. because of that, I like the idea, but I guess it took wrapping my head around that about like, well, this is the best way for me to make progress now. And I truly believe that in my heart. And so for me, it's a, it's a training plan that works. So I guess, I guess, you know, maybe like you said, fundamentally people might not like the idea, but like, you you know, I think of like, um, I think about, remember we were talking before about, uh, how Jordan Peters and Sasan were great training partners for a while, but then Sasan got really burnt out with it. And he said Mm -hmm. he he began to like really feel uncomfortable and he loathed the training and he was unhappy. But Sasan could really grow pretty damn well Without he training did. that way too, though. I mean, he grew yeah. well doing it, but he grew well obviously before he did that. You know, he was already a fantastic bodybuilder, and he could probably continue to be a fantastic bodybuilder without it. A guy like me, who's probably like more like ninety five percent of the people who are watching this, I don't have any other fucking options at this point. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, yes. It's like yeah. I'm gonna have to do something. You know, and it's like you were talking about on uh, the Mind Pump episode. Um, you know, you mm-hmm. said that the back in you know back in the day in the say the '90s or the 2000s, everybody was doing the bro split, 
five, you know, one time a week. And for, for the, the genetically superior, it seemed to work really well. But mm -hmm. for other guys, they might not have gotten, you said like, you know, the same hormonal response, just training once a week. And so it's almost like, I feel like going to this multiple times a week system for me, at least it's like, it's like I'm hacking that maybe Sasan doesn't need to yeah. hack that hack muscle yeah. growth, but I need to hack muscle growth to get that response high enough, you know, on a regular basis to, to grow. At least that's my guess. That's my theory. Yeah. You know, well, it was growth factors, not hormones. That's a whole other thing. Is it? Okay. So I yeah, used the wrong term. Factors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Cause people are like, Oh, he subscribes to the hormone hypothesis. And I, and I don't like that's been disproved, but it's literally it's the growth factors. Which have, like MGF, MGF. For instance, yeah. Those sort of, yeah. So, he, but the thing, it's awesome that you bring up Sasan because yeah, he was, I mean, he was a phenomenal bodybuilder training the way he had kind of like in, instinctively just kind of going to town and Actually, we when James came on the it's just bodybuilding, and talked about how he, James Hollingshead, yeah, and talked about how he had been training. He was just like didn't know what the fuck he was doing, you know. <laughs> he was just going, but he but he ended up getting his pro card, I think, or at least winning his class at the Brits doing that. So, but Sasan then was training, you know, all out in a way that he was making progress. I think above and beyond what he had previously in training with with Jordan. Absolutely. He was really growing. So he was, he, he did have a, a better training stimulus, but it wasn't better in that he, he could sustain it. And this is the same situation that someone without Sasan's genetic um, gifts might be in where they're, they recognize that maybe higher frequency training or more progressive overload training might be better for them. But it's the amount to which they can add that in and 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 still enjoy what they're doing, mm, yeah, and still continue to do that. So you you're like, I realize I have to do this in order to grow because of my genetics aren't aren't great, and and so you're like you're intrinsically motivated, internally motivated to go after that. Yeah, so you want to make that happen, and some people might might be quite as convinced. You right, about that. which I there was a time so, I wasn't right, you know. Yeah, and it took you a long time to do that. So, right. like the intermediate step would be like, well, let me try this out. Because mm -hmm. there's various ways you could do it. I, I could say I'm going to just give myself six months and just you know totally switch to something else, and yeah. hopefully not just follow it blindly. Or I can incorporate this to some degree. And and people do this all the time with fortitude training. They'll add one of the training techniques or some aspect of it into their program. They don't completely you know um, jump ship from what they have found has been working, but they add something that makes sense to them Okay. in the amount that works for them. So that they're comfortable with when you exactly. say that works for them, that they're comfortable with. Yeah. 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 That, 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 well, it works for them hopefully over the long haul in terms of muscle growth, but that is, 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 uh, sustainable. Yeah. They'll keep doing it and not be like, ah, fuck this, you know, and, and not want to do it. So they just go, if you go too far in, it just doesn't match your personality. And some people just don't want to train, like in the HIT, DC training, Yates, Jordan, Fortitude training style, where you're just pushing a large majority of your sets to a, at least a failure point or very, very close. Some people want to just train with higher volume, you know, and leave more reps in the tank. Yeah. So. That, so that's so if someone wants to increase increase frequency, most it's like it, it, it would be so rare. I, I'm trying to think if I've known anyone who was doing high frequency that then reverted back to the, like kind of a bro split mm. to lower frequency. That's hardly ever happens. Um, I could see but, that. Yeah, yeah. One, one way to do that either either direction would be simply to um, take a muscle group. And just stop training that as frequently or more frequently. So it's just basically make the change to one one uh, parameter of your program, one at, just how you train one one or two muscle groups. So if you're doing like you, everything split up over five days or what have you, you might have like every third day repeat a chest workout. Mm. So intersperse, you know, add chest in, you know, twice a week yeah. and see what happens with chest. Which makes sense because, and that's exactly, you know, as you know, that's what I did out of necessity, you know, because I had a heart, I was getting uh, tendonitis issues in my bicep 
when I trained five, six exercises of chest in one day. So I did Mm. half of it one day, half the other. If you're already doing a bro split, that makes total sense because you're going to have one day that's going to be like shoulders, shoulders only. You could easily do chest on one day and then chest and shoulders on the other day. Something like, you know what I mean? Like there's going to be space where you could fit that in to do two, two exercises for chest on another day, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's not, I don't think it's coincidental that very often the first thing people think of when it's, when coming up with strategies to increase a weak body part is to train it more frequently. Mm. (laughs) You know, that, that seems to work a lot of times. It's not always the answer. If you're training, poor training is going to get poor, poor adaptation. If you, if your training sucks and you're, you're not able to focus with the good mind muscle connection on the muscle you're trying to hit, then doing more of that's probably not going to help. But the higher frequency is, is the thing that has worked for many people. It's just that a lot of people don't want to do that for everything. Mm. <laughs> they don't want to train legs three times a week, yeah. for instance, just because they just don't. So, and that's fine. That would be silly to try to do that. It would be like, it's not optimal if you don't train. It might be an optimal training system if you could hypnotize yourself into, you know, you know, doing that and liking it. But if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. So it doesn't matter. And the key is recovery, right? At the end of the day, Absolutely. like you need to still recover no matter how many times yeah. you're hitting it, right? Yeah. And the thing that's interesting, like that occurred to me is, is one of the things that's, that I, I love to see investigated more that I think plays a big role is that the evidence kind of suggests if you look at like the relative increase in collagen protein synthesis or connective tissue protein synthesis, um, it's much less than that of muscle protein synthesis. And a lot of people try to run, they end up being sort of limited by connective tissue, mm, yeah. tendonitis, inflammation, those sorts of things. So it may be that in your case, like one of the reasons why you did better with taking that volume and spreading it out is that rather you were with that larger training volume on that one day, you were so superseding what your connected tissue could handle. You were just tearing down so much connected tissue that you end up obviously causing an inflammatory response there. But you, but your, your connected tissue was able to kind of keep up with the pace of training by doing less more frequently and that that in and of itself, even even if there is nothing about the higher frequency, um, per se, that but just allowed you to train with, let's say, a total of twenty sets, ten on one day, ten on another day, without getting tendonitis. Yeah. If you can do that for a year, it's much better than doing twenty sets on one day when you get tendonitis and have to like stop training two months every six months out of the year. Absolutely. So, yeah. So yeah. So just just picking the right training approach. That allows you to continue to train can be, make sense psychologically, but also makes it make sense physiologically too. Like when it comes to connective tissue. Yeah, I, I can see so, that. So we've got how much time we got? I know you got a. We got as much time we have. An, well, we technically I have an hour and a half until I need oh, to start okay. the next show. So got, got yes, you. I couldn't remember. So the other topic is the low versus high carb. All right. And this one has a little, there's a little bit more that, and this is, I'm going to speculate some on this, but it's very, I mentioned this in my Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach book, because I was aware of some of these data at that time, but um, very, very cool stuff. So we got another figure, I think we can pull up, the, this one will be, um, it says lowest carb, on the left, upper left, lowest carb, this is A to Z study in the upper left corner, individual data. Got it. Yeah. So guy by the name of Gardner has done a good bit of this research and he's got a, um, the, the title of the, the, the uh, paper that he wrote is tailoring dietary approaches for weight loss published in 2013. So there was a study in 2007 called the A to Z study. And that's what you see depicted here. In this case, the individual data. So what they initially did was they had a number of subjects. Gosh, you can see by, if you just counted the bars in each of those, the number of subjects that, uh, that followed each of these different uh, dietary approaches. Atkins, zone, I guess that's why they come with A to Z, um, uh, the Learn diet, and the Ornish diet. Okay. So the Learn, learn diet is sort of more of a, um, a higher carb type of diet. The Ornish diet was like lots of fruits and vegetables. The zone diet is berry sears, you know, it's kind of splitting things into thirds, and Atkins was a keto diet. Okay. So when they ran the comparisons on the weight loss 
in these obese individuals that carried out this study, I think it was women, um, basically it was pretty much the same. Uh, there was a little bit of an advantage for Atkins, actually, in the case of this study. And, and I'm not going to make much of that because that doesn't pan out in a lot of the studies. You just really, if you look at the, the data as a whole, you don't see low carb winning out over higher carb, generally speaking. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, sometimes it's the other way around, um, which, which doesn't surprise me, actually. But it's interesting, you actually can see if you look at those data, um, like look at the uppermost set of bars there next to the Atkins. And you can see the um, uh, the kilograms of loss. So at the bo- at the leftmost, you've got the same thing. That leftmost bar is nearly thirty kilos lost hmm. wow. by this individual. And if you look at the right, there's some people that actually gained huh. it's like seven or eight kilos huh. on the diet. Yeah. So, or somebody really got screwed on that zone diet. They look like they gained a lot. That one yeah, one person at like, the far end. Right. Like that, per- that was not a good choice for that person. <laughs> no, no. But it looks like for the most part, a- 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 the majority of people made progress on all the diets. Yeah, that they did. And, and, and that was what happened. But it was only like, we're talking like three or five kilos on average. Okay. Yeah. You don't see like this, you know, like less than 10 pounds, but you see tremendous variability. So the same mm-hmm. thing we've seen in the, in the other study, which I've seen, I've mentioned time and time again, you see it all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can kind of see, if you look at the Atkins there, like at the, the point of zero, um, no weight gain or weight loss is kind of further to the right. Mm-hmm. More people are on the, you have more bars on the left. There's a kind of a greater area. If you add up all the area of those bars yeah. on the left for weight loss. And that kind of, that, that makes you want to predict that what they actually found was that Atkins was a little bit superior, but no big deal there. So, Gardner went back and looked at several studies. Um, there are three studies that he reviews in that paper, and then he looked and reanalyzed the A to Z study. And when he looked at all those data, you see an interesting thing kind of uh, um, uh, kind of crop its head. And, and it's I'm not going to say that this people are going to say, oh, this is supportive of the insulin hypothesis. I've never heard anyone actually say that. I'm surprised it's never come up. Because this is, you know, this is a uh, is, is an anchor point for which people could could anchor their belief that insulin levels is are what's most important for um, fat loss because insulin promotes lipogenesis, inhibits lipolysis. So, like people who are big on low carb keto will say, like it's all a matter of insulin, blah blah blah. And I, I don't think that's the it's just too much. The, the system is choose just too complex to anchor it all onto one hormone. But interestingly enough, when he, when he looked those three studies that are mentioned in that, uh, in the paper, when he analyzed the A to Z study, again, comparing the Atkins with the Ornish. So he took the lowest carb keto and the Ornish was a pretty high carb approach. And they have made various measures of insulin sensitivity in those studies. So they try to measure everything they can to see the thing that's predictive. It turns out that for individuals who at the beginning of the, of the weight loss, the fat loss period, are the least insulin sensitive, they tend to do best over time with what you consider an insulin sensitizing diet, a low carb diet. Hmm. So if you're insulin insensitive, the best way to improve insulin sensitivity is to remove insulin or remove carbohydrate. Right. That makes sense. And, and as it turns out, that ends up being from those three studies in the A to Z reanalysis, what happens is that the people with, who are insulin insensitive do lose the most fat when they go with a low-carb approach. And the opposite is also true to a certain degree as well. So if someone is already has decent insulin sensitivity, a high-carb approach works well for them, hmm. maybe, maybe even better than a low-carb approach. Okay. So – that's that like that's really pretty pretty freaking fat that basically if you just take that as like a black and white as a as a guideline um that tells you that if someone comes to you really out of shape or if someone has a family proclivity for diabetes or they have a lot of body fat they're going to have poor insulin sensitivity and you can measure insulin sensitivity or you can get an estimate of it if you basically take blood glucose and they multiply that by resting um, fasted insulin levels. And it's an HOMA, 
homeostatic method of analysis of insulin sensitivity. That can be done easily with um, you know, regular blood work. Um, that will tell you whether someone might do better with a low carb approach hmm. versus a high carb approach. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and it's funny because I mean the guideline, the guiding principle there would be if you're insulin insensitive, then t- pick the diet that will improve your insulin sensitivity, and that's what those data seem to show. Hmm. Um, which also un- would would show that you could probably sh- your diet strategy may change depending where you're at, right? Because you could take a guy, you could take a guy who was very insulin resistant and get him insulin sensitive, and then he's going to need something different. That, well, that's where, that's the leap that I I was thinking about that. I, I I had this all written up for Instagram for those who are watching and Instagram just wouldn't let me post it. Well, maybe you'll get it up before the shows. uh, I'm going to figure it out, man. Okay. Just restart my computer 95 times until eventually it works. (laughs) Right. Um, I just have to resize those pictures. I could I couldn't do it on my phone because it wouldn't size them to show the full plots. Mm. Um, so let me let me follow with this. Yeah. Just say it's the important interesting thing they did a re, they did a, another study, and there was there was one genetic marker related to um, uh, variations in the gene for insulin receptor substrate one. So one of the things when insulin binds to its receptor there is there's something known as insulin receptor substrate one which is one of the signal transducers that that tells the cell to do what insulin's telling it to do so it's it's an important molecule in transducing the binding of insulin to its receptor to the intracellular events like um, depositing fat or inhibiting lipolysis or what have you so there was a little bit of either maybe there's some genetics involved so Gardner did a follow-up study and that's that last plot which we can probably throw up. All right. Pardon the pun. Let me see. I think I got it here. Is this the one with the circles on it? Yeah, that's the one. All right. So they did like a huge study, um, and they it took quite a while. They weren't able to get all the data uh, initially because they didn't have funding, but eventually they gathered funding, and they compared a healthy low-fat with a healthy low-carbohydrate diet. And look for that same effect. Is there something to do with, can we look at insulin sensitivity initially as a predictor of efficacy of the diet? Or are there genetics that we, we might, if we look in the, the literature, that might be predictive in some way, shape, or form? And they didn't find anything. So they got a little more detailed and said, okay, we, we think this is a real effect. Let's dig in on it and do a specific study, a low-carb versus a high-carb study. And so what I did is I go, how low carb did they go? Um, the interesting thing here is they only they were basically comparing a diet which was about twenty five um, versus about fifty percent carbs, or two hundred grams a day versus one hundred grams a day. Hmm. Okay, that's not a big difference. Okay, in my opinion, the way I'm thinking of that's not uh, it's not like zero carbs. If they hmm. compared. And Atkins, then maybe they would have found something. That's what they did with that reanalysis of the A to Z study, where they compared Atkins with the Ornish, mm. zero carbs essentially, or very very low with a very very high carb. So the data aren't absolutely 100 percent conclusive, but interestingly enough, there does seem to be something there. So so I, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see. I think it makes sense. Um, if you find, and, and the data aren't always conclusive to this effect either. Sometimes as long as you're in a caloric deficit and someone's exercising, you're going to get improvements in insulin sensitivity, whether it's low carb or high carb. If you go down, if you go down to like a thousand calories a day, you know, whether or not those you've got your, with your protein in place, whether you're all carbs otherwise or all fat otherwise, that's such a caloric deficit. You're going to have an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Mm-hmm. That's maybe not any different. But I think it does. It does make sense to some degree, because this is what this works for, well for diabetes: is to go with a lower carb approach for someone who is has poor insulin sensitivity. That would be the person who they know this from. They did a HOMA test, insulin measure fasted insulin and fasted blood glucose, or they've got lots of body fat, or they got a family history of diabetes, or what have you, and then a, pl- a try a uh, lower carb approach. And that might be physiologically, because remember these studies were pick the diet you think you like the best, mm. which is what people do in real life. Yeah, you know, 
they pick the diet that's been marketed to them the best. Right. <laughs> or they pick the diet that their buddy's doing. Or, you know, my friend said, all you got to just eat peanut butter crackers all day long and I'm going to lose weight better than anything. And she looks awesome. So I'm going to do what she did. Yeah. Yeah. Her whole face and her, her skin is orange now from the peanut butter crackers. But, you know, she looks great otherwise. I heard about this diet called the Ted diet. <laughs> <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> long, long time ago, guys. You'd have to. Yes. We should. We should. It, we should re-bring that one up though. sometime. Yeah. Didn't yeah. work. He never. It Ted never not. lost fat, huh? Ted did not. I don't think he stuck to it for very long. I don't think he did it for for all that. Okay. It was only a matter of a few weeks. But God, it was fun to watch him. <laughs> was, oh man. Well, I think it was ten minutes. Well, let's we'll talk about that. Well, fuck it. We'll just go into it. So this guy, Ted, who was the boyfriend of or one of our babysitters. Yes. Kid, we, like, yeah. We get the Ted story. The Ted diet. So yeah, Ted, <laughs> I haven't told this for a while. So I just, I got to watch him do this one time. So he figured, you know, he has a hard time with calorie control and, and, you know, just, he just couldn't keep his, keep himself from eating. So he's like, I'm going to just allow myself free reign, eat whatever the hell I want as long as I limit the time that I can do this. So it's kind of like a skip load in you, a way. It's a Ted, we'll call it a Ted load. You were, you were a little kid, you said at the time, right? Was, yeah, yeah. I was, I was probably like 10, something like that. You know, we, we needed babysitters when my parents would go on vacations or what. I think sometimes they'd go to like golfing tournaments. My dad would play golf and mom would travel. And so they'd watch us in the summers. And so Ted told you about the diet? Like he explained this to you, 10-year-old oh, kid? Yeah, well, we'd be gone. Um, oh, Ted was, yeah, Ted was highly corruptive. Yeah. Ted, Ted and, and his and one of his best friends were great. They were awesome. So, <laughs> Tina was her name, and Ted was her boyfriend. And sometimes she had to go do things, you know, because they would be watching us. Sometimes it'd be like a, a whole week. Yeah, there was this one golf tournament that lasted the whole week. So, so Ted, we get passed off to Ted now and again, and he'd take us over to his. I think it was his dad's place. This is where I remember this happening. Was his dad's dad had a ranch, lived out in the country, and. um uh, he would have gone shopping and he stocked everything up. So basically he would, Ted would, would set out before him all the foods that he's been craving and allow himself a 10 minute period to eat whatever the hell he wanted. Naturally. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and usually it was like, it was ice cream. And, and I just remember like just bowing down ice cream and him getting like the brain freeze from trying to eat the, you know, the chocolate <laughs> caramel ice cream too fast, you know, and then he tried to like mix in some other junk food cookies and shit, you know. And it was just like this really what I would probably think is pretty pitiful, you know, food fast for 10 minutes. And it, it did not work for him. But uh, yeah, I think I don't think he did it for very long. But that's, was, that's all he ate, you said, too, right? That was it. The 10 minutes. He had a 10 minute feeding window. Yeah, that was it. Like it was a, like the skip load, you know, well, you know, well, the hours. And of course, you eat other meals, I think, during that time. But right. this was no food other than the, the 10 minute Ted load window. Wow. wow. And yeah, yeah, it's just. It was awesome. He he uh they used to like he and his friend they would do prank phone calls while we got to listen. <laughs> and his friend was just a genius at this. Of course, this is my perception as a kid. Right. And he would like the one I remember him doing, because I ended up doing this later when I got to the age where I would do these sort of things. He would he would call people up and he'd say, uh, yes, ma'am, this is John Smith from the uh, the Quincy Fire Department. Uh, we have heard wind of a gas leak in your neighborhood, and we're trying to figure out where the gas leak might occur. I wonder if you maybe could help us out a little bit with this uh, with this issue, and be like, you know, it's like, of oh, course. of course, of course, of course. Well, what can I do? It's like, well, do you smell any gas currently? You smell like someone might have farted in your house, something like that. You know, it's, it's like this little weird thing, you know. And it's like, no, I don't. it's like, ma'am, do you smell farts? No, don't smell farts. Okay. He would he would just take this. He could keep a person on the phone for half an hour, have them wandering around the house. He had one. We had one woman put her head in her oven. She had a gas oven. Put her head in the oven. And he's like, "Ma'am, we need to know if the gas is on. Can you turn the oven on?" Oh my god! <laughs> he's like, "No, never mind. Don't do that." She was going to turn the oven on while her head was in the oven, <laughs> smelling for gas. So anyway, like those guys, they we used to do all sorts of crazy stuff. You made That's, it through all that too. You made yeah, it through that. And here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, we're not talking about uh, so far. The A to Z diet has not the the Ted diet has not been tested. Okay, in terms of whether or not it's better to have high or low insulin sensitivity to get uh, the best effect from the Ted ten minute Ted load diet. Yeah, but um, but I but it does sort of make sense that someone might do that. But here's the thing: the bottom line down always comes down to what. Diet is the person going to be able to stick with. 
You know, mm. that's the bottom line. You know, if and fruits and vegetables are not bad for you. So having some carbs, like going right off of the bat into a, like an Atkins style, like zero zero fruits and vegetables diet, might not be the best choice for someone necessarily. But a low glycemic low diet does seem to make sense. And those other studies that the Gardner um, uh, reviews in that paper were basically looking at high versus lower glycemic load. And that does make a difference in terms of insulin sensitivity. Okay. So just so, look, looking at this compared to now when you said training, you just have to get in there and try it to see what's best for you. Here we do have some predictors. You said insulin sensitivity would be a predictor as to what type of diet may work yeah. better for you are there any other predictors that this shows or that you can think of that we haven't talked about here anything else that we could say hey this would be another factor well the things that are associated with poor insulin sensitivity okay so you would measure that with blood work or just having high body fat and exactly what you said like that was a that that insight was the one that i had is that here's the thing and this is what i'll, I'll post once i get the instagram post up is that when someone starts off their diet and there's there's kind of two ways to look at this. One, if you've been if you're a bodybuilder who's been pushing, 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 um, you don't have to do much in order to reverse and start losing body fat. One of the things that I would do in years when I would just be pushing my calories up is I literally would just keep my make sure my protein was the same, and I would I would just eat according to my my appetite. Yeah. So if I were at six thousand calories, my appetite would put me down at like four four and a half thousand just wouldn't like, you know, gorge myself and the fat loss would come really pretty fast yeah. that way. I would actually feel better. Probably my knee would go up because I'm not feeling like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just constantly bloated all day long. Right. So I'd be more active and have a greater expenditure relative to my intake. Um, but if someone is, is not sure what to do and they've been they're you're kind of trapped with higher body fat, say it's a new client for someone, for instance, who's a trainer, um, it, the thought that if, if someone has a lot of body fat, it might make sense to at least diet them to the point where you get their insulin sensitivity under control. So you can measure that with blood work potentially or simply body fat. Hmm. So bring them down to lower levels of body fat. And here's what I think is potentially something that's worth worth checking into for a certain subset of people is it seems like if you have higher insulin sensitivity – you might and actually do better with more carbs. Hmm. Of course, you have to have a caloric deficit in place. Otherwise, the diet's not going to work. So someone might start off a diet simply by reducing the carbohydrate to increase insulin sensitivity. You don't have to go right to an Atkins. Go too fast and you'll just drop, you'll drop weight too fast. You don't want to do that necessarily, especially if you've just gotten some new muscle. And then for those people who don't do really well with low carb diets when they're getting down to like the six week, eight week, four week, two week out thing, they actually this this information suggests that some of those folks might be okay with more carbs. Hmm. And literally like instead of like going with a like a zero carb approach, allow the carbs to stay in. Hmm. Keep the caloric deficit. That's going to help with replenishing glycogen potentially, help with training. Um, so it's possible that you can do better even when you're insulin sensitized and you're, and you're dieted down with a higher relative carb approach. I could see that. But that's, that's what this kind of says is that literally you'd start with get insulin sensitivity under control. And then as you get more and leaner and leaner and leaner, you could actually start increasing your carb intake, um, relatively speaking, or at least don't cut it down too far. Hmm. One of the things that I found, maybe you found this with clients too, is that is that like the 100 grams a day range is like a no man's land. Hmm. And you're like, you feel like you can kind of go in and out of, of ketosis. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, I can like see that. Not, you're not, you're, you're kind of, you're starting to adapt to low carb, but you're not quite there. So some people just say, fuck it. And they just drop the carbs down except for trace carbs from like nuts and some veggies and that kind of thing. And they do better. Hmm. They feel better as opposed to like, the 100, 150 grams where they're just kind of like, they still have a carb cravings. They're probably getting a little, little bit of ghrelin release. And it's just like, there's a point where it's like, you got to like pick a side, so to speak. Yeah. And so that is an issue that, that people can run into. If they're trying, if they were down at like 50 grams and they try to go like to a hundred, then there's, then there's like just how you, a matter of how you feel. And I'm, 
I'm guessing as to why that is. Yeah. Um, like that you're pro- maybe sometimes shifting in and out of ketosis, depending on how big the person is. And if they've been previously keto adapted, I think there's some probably some epigenetic changes that occur where you can get really good at being um, in ketosis if you've done a lot of low carb dieting. Hmm. Um, so they have to, you know, figure out. And there's also like, so now I'm at 100 grams of carbs a day. So I get some good carbs now and again. And it's kind of like, like, here's the carrot. You can just have a little bitty bit of it, but not the whole thing. Mm. It's like, no, I don't even want to fucking see the carrot. Get the carrot out of my face. I yeah. don't want a dangling carrot of carbs. Yeah. Just no carbs. I'm going to enjoy, like, you know, all my my meats and my cheeses and my mm. sauces and my fatty sources. And I'll have carbs, you know, when I do a carb on the weekend or what have you. So that no man's land place can is not always a good one. Yeah, I could see that. Um, yeah. So. But anyway, but it's a new set of guidelines for some people who, you know, maybe would do better with more carbs. Mm-hmm. They might be able to do really, really well and still drop fat and and not feel like God. I'm just I'm I'm just I feel like shit without the carbs when I'm di- this dieted down. More carbs might help them. You you know what this reminds me of, Scott. There's been more than one case where I have worked with somebody, and and, and I'll specifically say like. Let's use like a, a men's physique client. I've worked with a lot of men's physique guys and I've had a lot of guys who've come to me that were new competitors, guys that had never really like quote unquote bulked. They had, uh, you know, just been staying in like decent shape and, and growing along the way. And then they say, Hey, I want to do a show. We do a show. And then after the, and we get them into incredible shape, let's say. Okay. And let's say that it wasn't a diet where they really had to struggle. We just took their diet and then we, you know, started adjusting it and we got some changes and we continued to do that for the next 16, 20 weeks, got them in really good shape. After that, they say, this is awesome. This next year, I'm going to put on as much muscle as possible and then we'll compete next year. They come back to me and they've eaten all of these carbs now for the last off season. And I believe, I believe this is what it comes down to is that insulin sensitivity. They come back to me and then what it takes this next time, they may have gained some weight. They may be bigger now. They've also right. gained some body fat. They've also been eating God knows how many carbs. A guy who's under 200 pounds, he's eating like 600 carbs a day. And right. now what it takes to diet him is a completely different ball game than what it took that year mm-hmm. before. I, mm-hmm. I really do think that that, and that's, I, I feel like that's reflective of what we're talking about here. So his body fat is much higher at the starting point after that year of, of sort of uh crazy bulking maybe maybe we'll even say maybe not maybe that maybe mm. he, he responded okay to the carbs maybe right. he didn't get to the point where he was really fat but a guy who has been eating now a ton of carbohydrates i can't just take that same diet that worked last year and make it work again a lot of times i've seen like these same guys now they've really got to grind they've really got to get the carbs down low to get the mm. same response and i really feel like it's like they affected something with insulin sensitivity through that off season yeah that is interesting um God, I've seen so it a many, bunch of times. Yeah, that's there's a lot of things that are involved. One, insulin sensitivity is a function of acute factors like what you've just eaten, yeah, um, what you've been eating for the last few days, and then obviously just your body fat and then your genetic proclivity. So, you know, someone has someone could be uh, eating a shitload of carbs. Someone could be relatively lean, and they've been just like you know on a on a carb fest for several days. And just been like constantly, you know, hyperglycemic all the time, and their insulin sensitivity could be pretty poor. But that, re- if they're lean still, that would revert relatively rapidly if they just drop back to a, a regular, normal, you know, eucaloric, r- normal carbohydrate intake type of diet. But if someone is or has a lot of body fat, just having that body fat tends to make them to be, end up being more insulin insensitive. So you think it's the body fat that caused is it that caused these I'm, issues? And, I mean, you're discussing, of course, because these are, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm I mean, talking you, in a general way. Yeah, you're saying with these guys, you know, maybe. Um, and, and of course, the, the other factor with what you're saying is there's also time frame. So if you start off with them, it seemed like you're saying they were leaner the first go around than the second go around. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, they were. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I would definitely say so, you know, to an extent. Okay. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so they got bigger and, and now they, let's say the first go around, they have 15 pounds of body fat to lose. And the next go around, they have 25 pounds of body fat to lose. That sounds and, fair. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just I'm just th- throwing out numbers, but so they but you try to do that in 12 weeks each time. No, and no. or whatever it's yeah, yeah. It's, you, you try to do it in 12 weeks. It's not gonna it's gonna be a hell of a lot different diet. Yeah, do those extra 10 pounds because that's like a, it's literally like that's like a yes you know, like a 60 percent faster fat rate or loss of fat or something like that. 15 versus 25 pounds like that's that's substantial. Yeah, so that's you're gonna have to create a totally different caloric deficit. And you may have to like go to different extremes to make that happen. So, yeah, this like this idea of like starting off with low carb, get the insulin sensitivity, and then consider adding carbs back in if you feel better with that would be, you know, when someone doesn't have to just like put the pedal to the metal to drop fat as as fast as possible. Mm, yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, that's a that's an interesting insight with those guys. Uh, were they are they coming back? Or they end up looking better at the end of that? I just found uh, they I, really have to struggle. Like they really, yeah. they yeah, they really have to struggle after after having really really pushed to move up. Even if they gained more right. muscle, you'd think like, oh, well, they have more muscle, it'd be easier to diet them then, you know. But it just, I've seen it happen more often than not. You know that that it's like it's a real huh. struggle then after like a real heavy long bulk to to get them in shape to get them to to respond to food. Like, you know, just as to, mm. to be as responsive just in general, if that makes sense. If that's, mm. yeah. if, that's a, if that's a word that makes sense, like responsiveness to changes. Yeah. You, you have to induce a greater, a, a greater changes in the diet to get the fat to come off. Exactly. Yeah. And, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It, it sounds like it may be just more fat to lose. So you have to do that in that order could, to get, get yeah, the fat loss. Maybe that's a, it's just kind of one of the things, side story, something that just kind of came up in yeah. my head, thinking about the topic. But 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 back to this idea. Like eventually, you know, they've got that one one the insulin receptor substrate gene, which was indicated in, in the in the A to Z reanalysis. The follow up study by Gardner didn't show anything, but I don't think comparing twenty five versus fifty percent of calories from carbs is that big of a difference. Hmm. Like that. That's if you really want to expose any difference in. Uh, the effect of insulin sensitivity on whether a low carb or a high carb diet works, you really want to have a, a high carb, a really high carb diet and a really low carb diet, like a keto diet versus the highest one. I'm not, I'm not sure why um, they didn't just repeat like the Ornish mm. compared to Ornish and Atkins because they already found that to be the case. I have to go and look. Maybe it's covered someplace that I missed in the, in the study. But this gives us some guidelines. So eventually, you know, if they if they are able to replicate those data and find that insulin sensitivity is a predictor of which diet's going to work best for you, um, then you could come up with some genetic predictors. Hmm. You know, we ran your we ran your genotype, Mrs. Smith, and it seems like you're going to do best with a, a, a ketogenic diet, yeah. or or you'd be fine with a zone type diet. That'd be no problem for you. Um, or, you know, we'll put you on a Pritikin diet or, or what have you, any of the various options. So anyway, this is, I, I thought this was some pretty cool data to, um, uh, expose the fact that if, if people do go, like you, if you just look at the averages and this is what happens all the time with the low and the high carb dietary, um, discussions is like, they're the same. And that's, that is true on average, but there's some variability in that. The, the the plots from the Atkins all the way down to the Ornish with the, with the range of like negative thirty like the, to that poor sucker who gained like ten kilos on the zone diet that's tremendous that's what matters to the people that's the applicability of science that's for scientists it's like it's just cool to be awash in a sea of statistics and nuances and ideas and intellectual flavor of the area that you study it's like oh this is just cool I like to tinker around. Some people like to go in into their garage and like to tinker around with their car and and futz around with this that and the other and but for m- other people they just want to know like what car is going to get me the best gas mileage and allow me to haul the things I need to haul or get the kids to school or you know what have you sure and and so digging in on the data in this way in the way that Gardner did and followed up on and the way that Damas et al and Barcelos those guys have done is awesome that to, to me is not only better science, but it's more applicable science because mm-hmm. they've actually gone and seen that, you know, we're not all the same. There is no average subject. Literally, there's no average person. You might have a number that matches the mean from some particular study in terms of some variable, but that would probably be the only one that matches. 
everyone's different in terms of their responses and adaptations to a given stimulus. Hmm. So what matters to you is what works for you. And the science can actually give us an idea at least to know that, well, high frequency works better for some people hmm. and does works better for other people. Now, lower frequency works better for other people. Some people just grow well. Some people don't. Low carb works better for some people. Maybe if those who are who are the who have the highest body fat or the least insulin sensitive are going to do do best in that regard. Hmm. Maybe not, but they're getting there. And so, you know, if you don't, don't, I think it's a bastardization of the science sometimes to always to 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 not look at the individual data. We don't do that very often. It's unfortunate. I heard on another podcast um, what's starting to happen more and more, which is really really cool. And it's sort of funny because it's, it's tradition has locked us into not doing this, but we have, you can put it, how much data is on the internet. It's like the data explosion is just ridiculous. All literally every single data set from every study that gets published now could be made public hmm. easily. Not a, you could just put it in the statistics file. We have PDFs for standardizing text files. You could do a standardized, like do an Excel spreadsheet or what have you, some standardized way to, um, add data, and then people can go back and do reanalyses, hmm. and that's what these guys have done with their own data, okay. and that's what pe- people have been doing with others' data. They get a hold of data sets. They ask the authors, "Can I reanalyze your data?" Yeah. Or they, or they get a get it, and and you look at it, and every, um, it's funny because you can have competent statisticians look at the same data set, and one will draw one conclusion which is substantiated hmm. and another might draw another conclusion which is substantiated and really it comes down to some degree to subjectivity and opinion huh. you know and so you uh, someone could say look at the barcelo study there was no different frequency didn't matter we, we studied all these people two two three five times a week doesn't make a damn bit of difference I'm like, well, it doesn't matter from when you ran the statistics that way, but I tell you what, it mattered for this guy. Mm. <laughs> Look at this guy that gained 20% on the high frequency and only five per seven percent on the low frequency. Yeah, it mattered for that dude. I know what I know what I'd be doing if that were if I were that guy. I'd be training with a higher frequency and or volume. Sure, and testing that out. So that's that that would be my interpretation of this. So I think more we can do this, and we, more we can recognize that their chest means. And the standard deviation bars are there for a reason, and the confidence intervals, and all those sorts of things. That's that's super important if we're going to make any any drive any value from the science. Hmm. So that's my rant for the week. Well, thanks for sharing it with me, man. This is yeah. uh, this is fun, and I think a, a lot of people are going to appreciate it. Um, guys, if you uh, if you have not yet. You know, we were talking about Fortitude Training earlier. You can go to FortitudeTraining.net. Check out Dr. Scott's program. And of course, BYOBBcoach.com. I got the book right back there. Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach. It's also uh, available at Amazon uh, and Barnes & Noble for the the hardcover like I've got. Um, and of course, guys, uh, check out TrueNutrition.com. You can uh, get a lot of great supplements like we talked about earlier today. Dr. Scott, as always, man, it's a pleasure. Yes, yeah, it was fun. All right, guys. We'll Thanks see you soon. Thanks everybody. Adios.